All right. Hey there, everyone. We're so excited to have you here this week for Nifty Methods. What month is this anyways? November. <laughs> Connectivity November. We're going to be learning today about designing your event with connectivity in mind, answering all the questions about the Wi-Fi, the internet, the pipe speeds. Brant's internet isn't working in <laughs> so we might get a real live lesson. We've been listening to them troubleshooting. I'm Lindsay Martin Bilbrey. We're so excited to have you and we're going to turn it over to Will Kern and Brant Kruger to get down to it and tell us all the things you need to know. A couple of housekeeping tips before we get started. If you want to participate, have questions, burning ideas, or just general things you want to throw at the presenters to see if you can throw them off their game, type it into the chat box. Tweet us at hashtag nifty method. We'll be sure to get your question in. Otherwise, take it away, gentlemen. Well, hey, everybody, and thanks for joining us. We'll see if my internet connection stays stable enough for us to charge forward with this. And we'll give you some insights into that throughout the rest of the presentation today, because uh, I'm going to tell you this, and you'll find out what it means later, which is that my internet speeds were dropping down to the kilobits per second, and we'll tell you about that in a little while. But for now, just know that I am Brant Kruger of Event Technology Consulting. That guy over there is the effervescent Will Curran. Oh, uh, I didn't prepare my, uh, my, my <laughs> adjectives. Oh, man. Brant caught me off guard. I got you, um, man. So, oh, we, so Will and I normally do a podcast. Well, we, not normally. We frequently do a podcast called the Event Tech Podcast. Uh, and in that, uh, we have a running gag where we use a random and ag adjective generator to uh, introduce each other. So I thought I'd throw him and uh, start uh, introducing him by that. While we're being silly and, and working that all out, we want to remind you all to please use the Q&A uh, and uh, let us know your questions as we go along. Uh, we're already starting. I asked everybody where they're, where they're uh, where hey, they're tuning go. in from. He's so, already um, doing the thing. All right. Me nice. Megan is coming in from Kansas City. So thank you for joining us, Megan. Fantastic. So yeah, please do ask the questions as we go along. We'll try and slip in the answers as they're available. If not, we'll try and get to them at the end. Um, and as I was saying, Will, you are from Endless Events. Um, uh, real quick, you guys have probably already read the bios, but I live up here in Minnesota where I'm a technical producer and I've been in the meeting and events industry for about the better part of the last 20 years, always with a focus in technology. And Will, how about you? And uh, I'm on the owner and founder of uh, Endless Events, uh, which is a nationwide AV event production company. So basically our goal is to make AV a lot less sucky in the world of sucky AV, um, where I hear about crazy things like four times amount of cost for AV and Wi-Fi for $30,000. So we're going to talk a lot about that today and uh, <laughs> uh, share, share some tactical tips for how you can uh, keep your events connectivity and save a lot of money along the way as well. So um, yeah, let, uh, should, we, should, we, should, we, should we jump right in? Should well, let's we, uh, get this thing going. So we need to know, everybody, if you are ready for the fire hose. So everyone, again, this is like interactive session. This ain't no typical webinar where, you know, you can't, you can't, you just get to sit back and kind of watch Netflix nope. style. We want some, some interactivity. So in the chat right now, if you're ready for the fire hose, place a one in the chat. Um, and that one, we'll see how many people are, uh, are ready to go. So just type a little number one. Somebody taps. Awesome. And we'll know you're good to go. Darcy, Megan, Linda, Jamie, Deborah, Kristen, Jennifer. You guys are ready to go and ready to rock. Um, so yeah, we're going to be placing a lot of links and resources in the chat as well. So make sure to stay tuned to that. Also send us your questions as they're coming in because we might be able to answer them along the way, but definitely at the end, we'll answer your questions. So Brent, we got the fire hose. Woot, woot. They're ready. There are Let's lots go. of ones in the chat. Let's start it off. All right. So, so here we go. The biggest thing that we want to talk about, uh, kind of start with here, is is even though we're talking about Wi-Fi and internet and all of that, you know, really important stuff, we want to spend just a little time talking about the fact that when we're talking about connectivity, we're not just talking about Wi-Fi and internet. That there's a lot of other things that we can be doing when we're designing and planning our events to kind of help facilitate. Uh, our attendees staying in touch, staying connected to their worlds, whether that's their personal world, whether that's their work world. It's more than just keeping our devices running, right? We want, it's more than just Wi-Fi. We, uh, sorry, it's more than just Wi-Fi. It's about keeping our devices running. So when we start thinking about keeping our attendees connected, one of the first things we want to start thinking about is about our outlet positions, right? So uh, a lot, you know, it's so often, you know, Will and I, we, we tend to work in the back of the back of the house, right? At the tech table at the back of the house. And it's so 
interesting to me to watch as people come into the room, almost always there's a certain subset of people, even if it's first thing in the morning, that are looking for a place to charge their phones or they're looking for a place to plug in their laptop. So clearly this is a priority for a certain percentage of a lot of attendees. Um, so where you place your outlets is actually a very important thing to start thinking about when we're talking about connectivity, right? We want to make sure that we've got, you know, even at, you know, even if it's just uh, some high, you know, high top tables around the sides of the room, you know, if you've got an outlet next to a wall and you've got some space back there, throw a high boy back there and let people have a place that they can just drift in and out or drift back and forward to if they need to charge their device, if they need to send a quick message, if they need to break out the laptop because something's gone horribly wrong back at the office, rather than forcing them to go out into the hallway or God forbid, all the way back up to their room, in which case there's a very good chance you're never going to see them again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the, the, the quick things you can do is a lot of times now too, people are wanting their laptops and phones out when they're taking sessions and taking notes. And a lot of us love classroom style savings for this. So then that way people have a nice table, they can put their drink at all that sort of stuff and kind of post up at. Well, one thing to consider is these awesome things that we found, which are these clamp on outlets for you to place on your tables and classroom style. What's great about this versus just placing the outlets on the ground or pushing a power strip on the ground, it doesn't force someone to bend over and have to get to it, but instead it's right there for them to plug in. You also see on these, these are really cool. They got USB outlets already plugged into there. So if they only have the cable, boom, they can plug in there, but it also it has a full outlet. And we're gonna talk about why full outlets are better than anything else really, really soon. But um, you know, these, these units aren't expensive. I think uh, I looked it up there like, 15 bucks to buy or something like that, um, brand new. So that kind of begs the question then though, if you want to do this, like where do you get it? Can you, can you ask your AV company to do it? What, what, what does that look like? So what does that cost look like? And like, what does it take for an AV company maybe to provide you these sort of things? Well, there's a couple different options. A, if you want this sort of thing, ask your AV company. This is what I want. Can you make it happen? And the only way you're going to find out if you can get it is if you ask, right? But the other thing as well is that if you plan on doing like multiple events per year, maybe it makes sense for you to buy it hang on to it, throw it in a Tupperware case and bring it to the event and give it to your AV company and say, hey, I know you guys are uh, you know, doing all the AV and maybe you're running the power cables for all the tables. Can you just plug these in for me and set them up for me? Boom, good to go. Or maybe here's an option as well is that let's say they don't have them and you don't want to buy them, you don't want to deal with them. Saying, hey, will you buy this? for me and then rent it to me. And they might say like, oh, this is a future business opportunity. Clients are going to want this sort of thing. And maybe they'll buy it and then give it to you at a rental cost as well. Yeah, um, so yeah. Especially, yeah, especially if you're in a multi, uh, multi gig situation with your AV vendor, you know, hey, we're going to be doing this in Boston, Chicago and Atlanta over the course of the next couple of years. It would be great if we could have this set up at all three of those gigs. That'd be really, really cool. Well, th there's also other places that you can uh, get, get people uh, outlets and power and everything like that. Um, and we want to give a shout out to one specific company, which is Court. And Court doesn't like pay us anything to do this. They're not like the only company that can do this sort of thing. I just think their furniture looks really pretty. And it's where I could find pictures of. Um, but a lot of furniture companies, you know, if you're doing soft furniture, for example, chairs, couches, things like that. A lot of them now, you can have outlets built into them or USB power and things like that. The, every single one of these pictures on here, it has a table or uh, something that has outlets already built into it. Again, making it easy to access. And honestly, it looks a lot cleaner as well than just doing that power strip right under the table as well. Um, and, you know, you know, worst comes to worst, you know, just put the outlets near furniture. Because if someone's sitting down, chances are they're going to be spending an extended period of time there they probably would love to plug in, right? So that's just a general feature there as well. So and it's another one of those reminders that, you know, that if you yeah, either put the stuff near the furniture or put the furniture near the power. So, you know, either way, just making sure that wherever people are going to be hanging out, there's power, or if there's power, people are going to want to be hanging out there. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like just look at all the airports. Where does everyone sit on the ground? Near all the outlets, right? <laughs> All right. So um, jumping into some more tactical tips when it comes to power um, is not just using USB plugs. I think far too often when we think of power, we think about juicing up just our phones and, you know, we're, and that's, and that's great, but there's always the opportunity that you want to use full outlets. And there's, um, before we get into the security aspect, I think Brandt, can you kind of explain like why the, why do someone want a full outlet and why should they consider using maybe like one of these breakout squids versus a, a USB outlet? Well, you're teasing this you're, by even mentioning the word <laughs> cybersecurity. You're hurting me already, but okay. But it's, 
because we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But it's, I'll, I'll, I'll resist the urge to launch into at, at this particular point. But that's the, the, the core of it is that, you know, uh, a lot of times those, uh, those uh, outlets that just have the little USB port in them, um, you don't necessarily know how much voltage those are delivering. And, you know, the, these, the proprietary chargers that come with your device. So if you buy a Samsung Note 10, the Samsung charger that comes with that is going to be the charger that is probably going to do the best job of charging it as quickly as possible. Um, a lot of times if you plug in, you know, an iPad into a Samsung charger or a Samsung into an iPad, depending on what it is and where it is, you're not necessarily going to get the full power of those, of those chargers. So those kind of built-in USB ports that you can use for charging frequently aren't delivering more than just the very basic bare bones level of power that can come in through USB because they don't want to take the chance of overdriving something. So they kind of tend to default to the underdrive. So provide, you know, it's, maybe it's good to have a couple of those provided as an option. I'll say why you might not want to do that in a minute. But for the most part, it's always better, in my opinion, to provide actual plugs rather than, um, the, you know, the, so people can, are, can plug into their own actual outlets so people can plug in their own plugs. Yeah, absolutely. And also, like, if someone's showing up with a laptop, too, obviously, they can't power that off of USB. They need a full outlet for right, that as right. well. And a lot of times, people are charged, coming with their own bricks attached to their cables, and they're ready to go. Um, and we'll definitely talk about from the security aspect why, why we want to do that. But, uh, you know... That, that, that's pretty cool. You know, do these breakout squids. These things are cheap again, like I think 15 bucks to buy one of these. It's just like a surge protector, but it's nice because it kind of bends in all different directions and people can use big, thick bricks. But there's another cooler, futuristic the wireless dumb. option. So obviously consider potentially doing wireless charging. I think this is so common now. Every, almost every iPhone has it now. You, your phone probably wirelessly charges. This is really, really cool. And it, there's one standard that uses for everything. It's called Qi or QI, wireless charging. And you know my, my Samsung phone does it. Brand's Google phone does it. Lindsay's uh, iPhone does it. It's the standard across the board. And what's cool is that a lot of furniture can be built into it. You can add wireless charging pads, but even Ikea now makes tables that have it built in. This is actually an Ikea table pictured here. And literally you just set your phone on it, it starts charging. How futuristically awesome. Yeah. Once you go wireless charging, it's kind of hard to go back. It's so nicely at the end of the night or whatever to drop your phone onto a wireless charger. So more and more people are becoming uh, kind of used to that idea. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's convenience factor right there. It's not going to be the fastest charge like we were kind of just talking, but the convenience of not having to dig out your brick and to just be able to sit by the table and set that phone down and have it start charging right away is pretty cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. When it comes to other power things, random power tips that we have as well, um, make sure that you're using flat cables for everything. So for example, if you're, pa if you're running power to tables across walkways, things like that, ask your AV company to specifically use flat cables um, rather than those big thick cables. Even if you're taping them down, they can sometimes be a little bit of a trip hazard, whereas the flat cables can almost go flush with the ground. Um, and it, you know, makes it uh, nice and clean for you as well. So I was just at an event where they had cables running across the hallway and the catering carts every time because it was the big thick cables. It was kachunka, kachunka with all the glasses and everything. Every, I mean, every single cart that was going over it, it was the loudest thing you've ever heard all because they were using those, you know, what are kind of standard outdoor uh, out, uh, uh, cables. Power, power cables. Nice. All right. Well, th there's another option as well for people to kind of stay uh, locked into it. And this is one of my favorite things in the, in the entire world. Um, and it's actually made by a company called SOS Charging Solutions. Again, like no one pays us to talk about this stuff. This is just cool stuff I found. Um, but what's great about this is it's a wireless battery pack. And we've all seen those like Anchor battery packs, right? Brand, probably you probably have one as well. Um, you guys probably have one like sitting in your bag right now. Well, what's cool about these, is they sit on the table and they have all the cables built into it. So people can literally just plug it out and pull and charge it. But what's really cool about this specific one is it's not just a battery cube, but it's also got a screen on it. And Brant, if you can put a screen on it, what does that mean? Gee, I think that means you can sell it, Will. Sell it in like what way? Well, like to a sponsorship. Oh, there you go. Well, what's cool about it is it's got a screen on either side. That's doubled the opportunity. And they also cycle through images as well. So you could sell multiple sponsors on it. And if this is the area where everyone's going to show up and like congregate around, I've seen that at events where like people are like, this is their favorite thing of the event. And they're going to literally know the sponsor that's on it. So you can take that. And instead of just it being a cost to you to improve your attendee experience, boom, now it's a profit center as well, which is fantastic. I love these things. They're really, really cool. And they're not terribly expensive. 
Well, well, Brent, I, uh, uh, going back to kind of USB charging, and these have some built-in cables and some USB outlets and things like that. And we, we kind of teased it a little bit earlier, but saying why you should not, you should be a little bit afraid of a potential USB charging going on right now, especially these USB cables. So lay us down. You're the cybersecurity king. Tell us why we should be worried. Yeah, if you'll permit me just a moment on the soapbox, uh, it's just something to be aware of and careful of, uh, that at this point, I'm, kind of, I'm pretty much recommending folks do stick to their own chargers um, or some kind of, you know, you know, you're buying a name brand charger from a reputable place. So, uh, you know, buying it from the Apple store or directly from Samsung, because it's been shown now very, very vividly and clearly um, that it is actually possible to completely own and hack your phones using these USB, uh, using both USB chargers and USB cables. So if you're just going and you know randomly plugging in to a USB port, um, the thing about USB that makes it so convenient is that it is both a power delivery and also like as we're plugging in our devices, right? It's a data delivery. So, so now not only are you able to conceivably uh, charge your device, but it, since it's a data delivery system, actually the ability has been opened up to hack these devices. So as a general rule, I'm kind of recommending folks at this point, stick to the ports, stick to the plugs, um, and you know, use your own personal chargers rather than plugging directly into a port of any kind, because you don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, I go to these convention centers and you see these charging stations that are lying around. You know, if you just rolled off the street, you know, the planner would probably assume it belonged to the convention center. The convention center would probably, uh, you know, blame it on the planner brought it in. Meanwhile, it's been some third party that's brought, brought these things in. Also, if you look at the image there really closely, um, what you see there is a charging cable for an iPhone, and they've actually gotten so good at miniaturizing this. There is now, in fact, a hacking cable that's been developed and is for sale um, that you can kind of just buy on the internet that allows you to completely hack and own an iPhone. It looks exactly like an Apple charging cable, um, but built into that cable is a tiny Wi-Fi device. So you plug that cable in, whether it's to a regular charger or a USB port or anything, and it has the capability of actually hacking and owning your phone. So uh, that's uh, that's kind of my soapbox moment. Is stick to the uh, stick to the. Uh, the, the actual uh, VM, the, the factory charging cables that you're given, or at very least, make sure you're getting them from a trusted manufacturer. Yeah, so, I mean, they're if you want to know now, more, don't... Oh, if you, yeah, if you want to know more about this stuff and all the, the crazy nerdy things, do you, Brent, could, do you think we could like give them a resource where they could just learn all about cybersecurity and its vulnerabilities of events? Well, yeah, Will, I wonder if there was something people wanted to read more about uh, when it comes to cybersecurity in their webinars, uh, where, where would they go? Well, oh, uh, there we go. Oh, we oh well, the... well, Brent and I have done a full hour long webinar. We could literally talk about cybersecurity for literally an hour, and that's what we yeah. did. So we turned it into a full on webinar where uh, you can learn about these cybersecurity um, concerns and also make sure that you're addressing them when it comes to your events. Um, and a lot of stuff you like is related to connectivity. We're going to talk a little bit about it later, but make sure that you, if you don't know what we're talking about when it comes to vulnerabilities of USB ports or Wi Fi, or you, you don't even know how secure your event is technologically. This webinar is for you. I'm going to post the link in the chat. Um, that's where you can go to sign up. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we have so many, so many resources available as well. So, all right. I'll continue on, on more. My favorite ones, yeah. All right. All right, Brent, tell me a little bit more about this one. So we've talked about keeping the furniture near the stuff, near the power, keeping the power near the furniture. One of the things that I really am liking and I'm seeing a few venues do and a couple of events starting to play with is again, let's just be honest about the fact that life is going to happen, right? People are going to need to make a quick phone call. They're going to need to check in at the office. Um, you know, we go to these giant, uh, uh, you know, conferences like an IMAX or something like that. You're miles away from your room. So the last thing you want to do as an attendee is to go, you know, go all the way back to your room just to hop on a conference call. So create a little mini co-working space out in the you know, you know, create a little space where you've got some, you know, glass in the places like court uh, have these kind of modular systems. I think Freeman's got some kind of some of these systems as well, where you can create a little pop up co-working space where you can just sit 
hop on a quick phone call, bang out a couple of emails without having to go all the way back to your room. So this kind of falls again into this idea of you're designing your event with connectivity in mind. You're being realistic about the fact that people are going to want to do these things so you might as well provide them for your attendees. So think about adding these little co-working spaces as a way to keep them nearby and not running all the way back to their rooms. I'm a huge fan of that. I mean, like far too often, yeah, I'm looking for a space and I'm going to build it myself if I need to, you know. Um, and one of the cool tips that we have, we recommend is, um, you know, not in addition to putting outlets and having a super strong Wi-Fi in the area, but maybe also like providing an attendee hardwire connection as well. And you know what? There's a little bit more we have to dive into this, like hardwired versus wireless. So do you think we should kind of pivot into the internet connectivity thing and start talking about the difference between it all? I think we should, but I did just have a wonderful idea. Ooh, tell me. Pillow fort co-working spaces. In, 100%. I mean, what if you could like build your own little space and you could make <laughs> yourself... <laughs> You could work on your emails and stuff like that. I'm, I think we should work on that. All right. For, all right. Uh, if you're down for some pillow fort uh, co-working pillow spaces, fort uh, let co-working us know in the space. chat for sure. But let's start talking about inter- internet. And I mentioned something about hardwired internet. Brant, why does hardwired internet matter? And why should people know the difference between it and Wi-Fi? Whenever we're talking about hardwired internet, we're talking about literally using a, a wire, Ethernet to connect uh, into the system. And the part of the reason that you want to do that is it's a reliability thing. So anytime you've got a, a situation, um, uh, you know, where you're, you're going to want to be connecting and making sure it's connected, um, and we'll get into a couple of different reasons of why that would be, but just, you know, for to, to be the ground when we're talking about hardwired versus wireless, we mean literally that, right? Wi-Fi, wireless, floating around in the air versus a hardwired connection. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that's going to matter, where it's going to be helpful for you to do that. So we talked a little bit about the difference between that. Well, when to know when you need it. The simple thing is when it's mission critical. So for example, Brett and I are both on hardwired internet connections today because we know that if our internet goes down, this webinar will not happen, right? <laughs> Consider that mission critical. So a lot of times when it comes to, to internet, we're going to talk a couple places where it's going to really matter, but just think about that. Anytime it's mission critical. So the recommendations, live streams, registration, especially if your registration is going out to the internet, right? Um, things like, for example, content downloading. So if you have to download a lot of presentations, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but also, let's say like you need to be on your laptop and make sure that you're cl- uh, grabbing the schedules and Slack in your team and things like that. Throw it on a hardwired internet connection all day long. Well, uh, Brent, we've, we've used a lot of uh, nerdy terms. Ethernet, hardwired internet connection. Well, is there like a book that we have that explains all the internet event terms that uh, people need to know? I believe there is. If you want to know more about some of these terms, uh, one of the reasons that I love doing webinars and things with Will is that if there is an ebook for it, chances are he has made it. Um, so if you go and you check out uh, bit.ly event Wi Fi terms, uh, we'll handle some of the terminology that we get through here. Because, like we said, this is kind of a fire hose today. So that's why we're trying to give you these little extra resources as we go. So if you want to go deeper into any one subject. But I want to just kind of hit, you know, and, and re emphasize that point that you just made there, Will about the, the 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 mission critical part like for me that is always the dividing line so if people are on the on the fence about whether or not it should be a hardline internet or i can just connect to the same wi-fi as my attendees that's the question that i have to ask is what happens if that demo doesn't work you know what happens mm. if you know is it you've got c level you know out on stage and is presenting a new product um, you know, and it has to be live for whatever reason, um, you know, then you need that to be on a hard wire in it. If it's just a breakout session and, you know, it's something that maybe they've seen already um, and it's not that big of a deal, if it doesn't actually go through, that's different. If you're in a breakout session and it's actually this is a hands-on with a product and we need to be actually a, using it, you know, live and on the internet, you know, then we should probably bring in a hardline cable for that. So um, it's really the easiest way to do it. And I, I, you know, you know, you know the story that I like to tell Will about this association client that I had. And oh, but you gotta wait. We're, 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 we, 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 you gotta wait. There, that's coming oh, a little bit later. Yes. Sorry. Oh my yep. gosh, you're like you know, I jumped the gun. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, we, let's talk. Sorry. Let's talk about some of the the things that are mission critical. Let's start off. There you go. Okay. Okay. So we mentioned a little bit earlier, live streams. 
right? So everybody wants to live stream their event, you know, whether you're sending to Facebook, Periscope, or a custom platform, hardwire your live stream, 100%. You're playing on a live stream, make sure you have a hardwired internet connection. But the, the problem is a lot of times I get asked, this is the most common question, how, well, how much speed do I need for a 1080p, 720p live stream and connection and everything like that. Um, if, if you haven't noticed yet, we kind of made resources for everything. I actually made an event bandwidth calculator um, because I got asked this question is how much, how much actual internet do I need? Not only for my live stream, but also like I have 500 attendees. They each have two devices, all these things like that. It's all built out on that event bandwidth calculator. So go check that out um, and you just go to, again, bit.ly. I'm going to try to type this in the chat real quick for you guys. Um, bit.ly slash how much bandwidth. I try to make my URLs as like easy as possible. Um, but literally, you just plug in your event specs right there and boom, it will spit out exactly how much um, internet that you need for your event. Also, how much you need if you want you doing registration, all that sort of stuff as well. So go check that out uh, as well. But this is brand's favorite one internet demos so <laughs> <laughs> well i did i did see you know i was actually looking at um uh, at the chat here and i think this might be a good place to, to answer oh, yeah. this question as you were just talking about bandwidth and speeds and things like that um uh, she asked um uh, how accurate are the wireless internet speed test apps uh, that measure bandwidth in a given area? And it's a fantastic question. Um, she said, are, are the readings a good indicator of the bandwidth actually being allocated to my attendees? Yes and no. Sometimes. It is a snapshot. <laughs> it's a snapshot of that moment, right? So if you run a speed test when there's nobody on it, you're going to get the full pipe, right? It's going to be whatever they are allocating to you. So what you kind of need to do is run it while someone else's event is going on. So when you're doing a, a site visit or something along those lines, that's when you duck down and get access to, to the Wi-Fi and run your speed test to find out if you're getting it when it's under full load. Because how these things are handled, and we can, we'll touch on a little bit more of that later on in the presentation, how Wi-Fi the connectivity is handled kind of varies depending on how many people are in it and all that kind of stuff. And your location in the building, we'll touch on that in a moment as well. So yes, they are accurate, but they're accurate as of that moment. So you really have to kind of think about, is this a realistic test at the time? The other thing that I'll throw on there is I do not use uh, speedtest.net, uh, whichever the basic one, the one that everybody uses, because hotels and convention centers and places like that have started to give that green light priority. So when they see someone is typing in speedtest.net, they give that full bandwidth and let it go up to its biggest speed. Whereas if it's any other speed test, you're kind of getting a more accurate reading. So I will put that caveat on there. I use one that's called DSL reports. So DSL is in the old telephone internet connectivity technology reports. So DSL reports.com. Um, and there's a speed test there that I find to be a little bit more accurate for that reason. Uh, an app that I really love is called uh, Wi-Fi Man uh, for like Wi-Fi Manager. It's by a company called Ubiquity who makes like a lot of enterprise grade hardware. Um, but uh, I don't think I'll get in trouble for showing my SSID. So um, it show, <laughs> what's cool about it is it'll show you all the networks nearby and their strengths. But also uh, you can come over and do a speed test. And it does a couple things where it shows you beyond just the speed. It also shows you a little bit more data as well. But that's a little bit more nerdy. Um, I don't think we ever mention it on this this webinar but the best recommendation we have is get basically an it person find somebody who understands network connectivity and have them be on your team just like you have someone who might be in charge of the breakouts or someone who's in charge of the parties or in charge of the catering this is a critical element now and if you have someone who can talk nerdy with them they also can do all these tests while you focus on the broader event as a whole and i don't think we ever really talk about that great so, Back, back to internet demos, yes, I brand's think we favorite get thing. Back to it. Yes. Um, <laughs> so internet demos. This is one of the things that um, it would be another, you know, it's another one of those, uh, you know, pri is it a priority? Is it mission critical type things? So internet demos. Um, anytime you need to be connected to the internet to demonstrate a web page or something like that. Now I will, I do want to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to tell my story in a second, um, uh, that, you know, just make sure that, the, the, all right, clear my thoughts. What I'm trying to say is, <sighs> what I'm trying to say is internet demos frequently can be replaced. Uh, so it's, it's one kind of thing. So the question that I need you to ask, if someone's trying to do an internet demo is- like Show up the software and that right. sort of thing. The question that I need you to ask is, 
do you really need it? Do you really need it? Right? So the story, really? that, yeah, the story that I started to launch into before is association client and multiple conversations before the event. I'm starting to tell this story shorter. Well, I promise. Um, Multiple conversations before the event about do you know do you need any, do you have internet access for the speakers? No, we do not. Multiple conversations. Then on site, the speaker approaches the planner and us at the tech table again. I really need internet access. I need internet access. I need to show this demo during my presentation. You need it? Do you really need it? Yes, I really need it. Okay, so we like literally pulled people off lunch and got a hardline internet connection going up to, out to the uh, you know out to the lectern so that people could you know run their presentation from the thing, and um, we got it all set up and it cost a, a fortune right? Because it was the last minute because anything done at a hotel in the last minute costs a fortune. And then they tippity tap and he goes through his presentation. And then we like, wait, he didn't do the demo. He just skipped right over the demo. And afterwards he came up, he goes, Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot the demo. So clearly it wasn't vital to the presentation. It wasn't an important part of the presentation. So really ask your presenters, does it need to be live? Because Will a, you know, will a screen grab suffice? It's so easy these days. It's trivial to do a screen capture at this point. And you don't have to spend a lot of money on software anymore. You used to, you know, a while ago. So just, just record, pre-record what it is you want to show the people when you're on a good hard connection back at the office. And then just play that as a movie. That is so much safer, so much cheaper than doing a live internet demo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you bring up a good point too, that a lot of times people come up to the tech table and they say, oh, hey, um, so I, I, I redid my whole presentation. Can you, uh, I send you a Google Drive link and you can just re-download the entire thing? Or, hey, um, I, uh, I, I have a song that we need to play as the intro and everything's good to go as an AV company. And the thing that I always say to that, since Brent, Brent got on Soapbox for a quick second, is don't always assume that the AV guys have internet. In fact, I feel like a lot of times everyone just kind of forgets that we are part of the team too and we need internet access. A lot of times very fast internet connection, which we'll talk about in just a second. But a lot of times now the show flows and the spreadsheets are all online on Google Docs. Your presenters are coming up to us asking about downloading stuff last minute, you know. Oh, hey, I just emailed you that file. Can you grab it? Well, what ends up happening a lot of times is that if we go, well, okay, uh, well, we need access to the to the the convention Wi-Fi. Oh, well, I only have six devices and I gave five of them out. I only have one left. I'm like, well, I have a team of like seven people who need it. And it ends up getting out again last minute. But also we feel bad. We're like, oh my gosh, like we don't want to make you get charged like a hundred dollars a day for Wi-Fi that, you know, like things like that. So what ends up happening a lot of times, the AV guy sacrifices his personal hotspot. And he busts out his hotspot and just says, okay, like I'll figure this out and I'll just use my own. And we end up destroying our bandwidth for like the, the week, right? And then we end up doing a show the next week and it happens again and again. So just don't always assume your AV company has internet. And if you know that you're going to be doing things like show flows on Google Docs and everything like that, make sure that they are siphoned some Wi-Fi and they're good to go. That's just a little personal PSA as well. Um, but we talked a little bit about making sure that uh, if you're downloading content, that uh, you have a high bandwidth connection. Brent, you want to kind of explain a little bit of that? Yeah, I think we pretty much touched on this one and we probably need to start moving things along because yeah. I'm looking with what we've got left to cover in here. So yeah, just make sure if there is someone on the team who's definitely going to be downloading a lot of PowerPoints or videos or things like that because you know they're not done, you know? So, you know, obviously the best case scenario is somebody shows up on site with a hard drive and says, here you go. But, you know, if you know you don't have that type of group or you've got a lot of materials that are still being built uh, before you actually get on site and you know you're going to be downloading them, make sure that person has access to a high bandwidth, preferably hardline connection. And you might be like thinking to yourself like, okay, if I want to, you know, negotiate this Wi-Fi stuff, um, we did a whole webinar just on negotiating Wi-Fi specifically, but whenever you're talking about speeds of internet connections, pro tip right here, um, I can quickly tell if someone knows what they're talking about or not by just this simple terminology, megabyte, which is capital MB versus megabit, which is M lowercase b. Reason why that matters, there's eight bits in a byte and internet is always talked about in terms of speed is megabits per second. So if you have a hundred, you know, as your internet connection, don't say it's megabytes per second because then I'll know that you don't know anything about internet and we want you to have the power to say you know what you're doing so then they give you better pricing, right? So always use the terminology megabits per second to talk about speed of internet connections. A um, little pro tip again, lower capital M, lowercase b for megabits per second. So, all right, 
Talk about mission critical, wrapping up that little section, mission critical staff as well. So a lot of times just make sure your mission critical staff, people with agendas, who need to talk to each other, download files, make sure they have internet. Don't let them forget and just decide they're gonna use their phones, all that sort of stuff. So talking about negotiating internet into contracts. Um, oh my gosh, we could talk about this literally for a million days. Just make sure that when you're looking at your venue contracts, negotiate the internet and the costs and the speeds and what you need before you sign your venue contract. Because afterwards, it's called begging. Begging, yes. Yeah, yeah, there you go, yes. there you go. Audience, you guys gotta yeah, join us in the chat. Begging, right? <laughs> so yeah. make sure that you negotiate ahead of time so you're not begging for it afterwards. So, let, so we've kind of gone into like hardwired, mission critical stuff. Now everyone's question is just Wi-Fi, and this is a whole section on its own as well. So when it comes to uh, negotiating Wi-Fi for all your attendees as well, um, you want to make sure that, uh, that you, you, again, do it before you sign your venue contract. Yeah. So not only do you need Wi-Fi for all your, your staff and for the AV company and everything like that, negotiate for all your attendees ahead of time as well. Consider it part of the features. You know, we could easily do an entire webinar de devoted to negotiating. So if people wanted to find out more about how to negotiate their, their hotel Wi-Fi, well, where could they go? Well, I made a webinar where literally I talk about all the things that you need to do. I forgot if I put it in here, um, but yeah, all about negotiating uh, hotel Wi-Fi. Um, and it literally talks about all my tips, all the things I think you need to know about, all that sort of stuff. So you just head over to bit.ly slash negotiation, negotiating Wi-Fi. Um, and I'll post that in the chat as well for you to click on um, and go check that out. Um, so for the first thing that you want to come up when it comes to Wi-Fi is understanding the concept of access point placement. Brent, can you explain a little bit what an access point is and why it matters for? Yeah, let's, let's, it is? let's get a little nerdy here because, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're about some some heavier duty stuff but i touched on it earlier where we started talking about what's going to affect uh the quality of your wi-fi the speeds of your wi-fi and things like that this is one that's kind of a sneaky one um uh, is worth mentioning so the access point the physical devices right that people are connecting to now what's pretty common is that you'll have you know three or four kind of around your convention area and then you know as you go down the hallway right now you've got one here and one here so you, you think of it kind of as a as a, as a mesh, right, of that's being blanketed in Wi-Fi. But then it starts to string out a little bit as you go down the hallway because you've got one device, one device, one device that might be barely overlapping each other. The reason that starts to get complicated is when now you're trying to do a reception that's out on the you know patio outside. So now you're even one more step away. So while you may have let's just say 200 people uh, in the room trying to access it in the meeting room, they're gonna be able to hit two or three different potential access points, right? So maybe there's 10 over here, there's 40 over there, there's 50 over there. But once you get out to that patio, they're only going to be able to hit the nearest one. So that's gonna where you're gonna start to see congestion and things like that. So even though it's the same number of people and it's the same Wi-Fi, you know, SSID, it's the same Wi-Fi password, it's all that kind of stuff. They're going to have a lot more trouble out there on the patio just by the nature of the fact that they're only able to hit one single access point. Now, the only other thing that I want to say on this particular topic is that Wi-Fi access points also generally have a cap as to the number of users that can hit them. So once again, if you're in a giant ballroom and they've got multiple access points and each one of them can do 500 uh, different, you know, simultaneously connections. That's fantastic. You know, you're going to be able to cover a couple thousand people. But once again, as soon as you move out into the hallway and out into the patio, now you might only be able to have up to 500 people at a time accessing the internet. That's a great point, Brant. And uh, I'm going to answer this question before someone types it in, because usually the next question is, how do I know how many access points or how many people per access point, that sort of thing? It all depends. Uh, depends on technology, things like that. That's where that IT person can really help with. But the important thing to know is that if you're planning on doing an event in more of an obscure area, check the Wi-Fi. Go out there with the Wi-Fi man app, see what the, the signal strength is, ask the IT company or the, the internet company, hey, is there access points out here to be able to cover this area? That's simple. So um, other things too, a lot of times people tend to blame the Wi-Fi. This is just a more of a pro tip, random tip for you guys. Don't always just blame just the Wi-Fi. Um, and this comes from uh, Roel from during our Wi-Fi 6 episode on Event Tech Podcast, is that a lot of times the Wi-Fi is you have access points and those feed into switches and those feed into routers. There can be a million different things that could be causing it. Also, sometimes it could be slow, not just because the Wi-Fi is slow, but because the internet itself is slow that's feeding it. So it's something just kind of keep in mind. There's a lot of pieces that kind of go into this. 
services is not always just the Wi-Fi. Um, so always just keep that in mind as well. So when it comes to questions that you want to ask when setting up your Wi-Fi, one of the first questions you always want to make sure that you tell your, comp your, your, your internet provider how many people are planning on being connected in this room, in these areas, almost creating like a heat map of where everyone's going to be can help them understand what the flow of the event is, what people are going to connect into it. The next major question you want to ask, what are they doing on it as well? Um, are they streaming? Are they doing lots of social media? Are they just checking their email every once in a while? Are they, you know, um, planning on doing any games now that live stream games is a big thing? What are your attendees going to be doing on that internet? And then that helps you kind of build it out. Similar to that bandwidth calculator helps you build out how much speed you're going to need as well. Um, and again, we kind of talked about this, but number of connections per access point, just keep in mind, you can't put a million people on one single access point. Uh, so yeah, as Brent kind of talked about. And oh my gosh, I just gave you a ton more internet terms. This is a reminder, I wrote a book that's literally like a dictionary on all these nerdy things we just talked about. Um, so make sure that you go check that out. Um, again, bit.ly slash Wi-Fi event terms or event Wi-Fi terms. Um, and that'll be super duper helpful for you. So then that way you can stay on top of all the nerdiness, understand, you know, the tech that you need to understand. So, all right. Let's go into some event apps. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think one of the one of the reasons that we wanted to touch on this is because it's kind of the number one like mission, not mission critical, but it's, it's the biggest Wi-Fi add-on that most of our events are having right now, right? So as, as we're coming in, we're asking our attendees to download the app. Um, and so one of the things that we recommend as you're trying to figure out how much bandwidth you need and all those kinds of things is talk to your event app provider. They're going to have a lot of good data uh, as far as, you know, roughly how much uh, bandwidth their app is going to require just for their stuff. So obviously you're going to need to be thinking about your attendees, uh, you know, day-to-day -day operations as well. You know, how, how, how social are they? Are they going to be on Instagram? Are they going to be doing videos? Are they going to know all that kind of stuff? But at the very least, you're going to start to figure out what your baseline bandwidth needs are going to uh, when it comes to the event app. I love that. Yeah, definitely rely on your vendors to be able to tell you what they're going to need for when it comes to internet. Um, I did a whole video on this. So like I, I wanted, we, can, we don't have a lot of time to dive too deep in this, but Wi-Fi also creates sponsorship opportunities for you. We talked about how you have these battery packs, but the, thing, the notes that you want to know is that sponsorship opportunities exist in Wi-Fi in the password. So for example, let's say your Wi-Fi name is blah, 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 convention, and you have Puerto Rico as a sponsor, make the password Puerto Rico and sell it as a sponsorship. So that way every person's going to say, what's the Wi-Fi password? Puerto Rico. Well, everyone's going to be talking about Puerto Rico during the entire conference. Also, the SSID, which is the name of the network. Um, again, you might want to just default name it, you know, whatever conference, but consider that a sponsorship opportunity as well. Maybe naming it after a sponsor again, so everybody's asking about it. Um, and, and also just the, the, the security webinar talks about put a Wi-Fi password on your Wi-Fi people. It's, uh, you got to do it these days. Um, but also captive portals, which are the things that the web browsers that pop up and say like, you know, enter your hotel room and your last name. Those also can be branded as well. These things are all super cheap and easy to do. Sell it as sponsorship. Use it as a chance to recoup your costs on your Wi-Fi since those costs are getting out of control. And since you're going to be printing the Wi-Fi password everywhere so everyone knows what it is, sponsor those as well. Wi-Fi brought to you by Red Bull, that sort of thing as well. So talking about mobile connectivity as well, this is kind of a, a side bit because people also want to use their phones, not just hop on the Wi-Fi, right, Brant? Well, and it's the number one thing that people say, you know, when they, oh, they look at the Wi-Fi bill and they go, that's way too expensive. I'll just let everybody be on their phones. Well, you have to start taking into account, you know, the mobile connectivity. So be sure to take into account things like the different carriers, right? So you could be in a space that works great for AT&T, but works terrible for T-Mobile or works great for Verizon, but works terrible for, you know, AT&T. So, you know, be aware, have multiple people on your team take a look at the mobile connectivity, what's available in that space. Check those outdoor spaces as well versus the indoor space. Might work great out on the patio, might be terrible, you know, once you're into the convention center and you're at the far wall away from the city. So really wander around, take a look at those bars. You know, there are some locations where I've got fantastic internet service on my phone up in the room, but the second I go down into convention land, it's gone, dead, completely does not work. So you really need to pay attention to that if you're going to be one of those people that's like, well, you know, I don't have a very techie audience they'll be fine on their phones they also might be really cranky once they get into your general session and there's no wi-fi provided 
Absolutely. And another thing to keep a caveat to think about when it comes to doing lots of mobile hotspots is that as soon as everyone, for example, let's say you do a big trade show and you don't decide to provide them Wi-Fi or it's way too expensive, you haven't negotiated ahead of time. Well, they're all just going to say, oh, I'll just bring my own hotspot and everything like that. If you've ever been to a gigantic exhibit hall, you'll see the thousands of network names when you're trying to connect. This creates a major issue. The air in the, the radio waves is like a, a river. You don't want it to be too full of st junk Otherwise, you can't get down the river. Um, so just something to keep in mind that just deciding to do lots of mobile hotspots is very, very bad, which is why a lot of um, convention centers and hotels will push to say, no, please just use our Wi-Fi, please, 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 because we want everyone to have a good time uh, as well. So, um, and, and chatbots, right? Everybody's using SMS chatbots now. Again, Brant talked about it. Like if you get crappy service, well, all of a sudden your chatbot, which is going to run your entire event, now all of a sudden you can't connect to her to send a text out. Yikes. <laughs> well, and I, and actually, if we could just go back one, I know, I know we're, we've got a lot more to cover, but I just want to emphasize this point that, that um, we're starting more shows and organizations that are actually saying, you no, you can't use your own mobile hotspot. You have to use the, the provider that we're doing that. And it's not because they want to make money or anything like that. It's because of this thing that Will was just talking about, where if you've got 200 mobile hotspots, nobody's going to get good internet access because the way that Wi-Fi works, it's not actually a point to point thing. So it's not like you to your hotspot and then the hotspot off to the cell towers and everybody's happy. Uh, it actually, when you're sending Wi-Fi signals, it's broadcasting to every single hotspot that's out there. And then, oh, you're the one I'm supposed to be talking to. Every single one, oh, you're the one I'm supposed to be talking to. And so the more people that have hotspots off, there's famous footage of Steve Jobs actually telling people, you got to shut off your hotspots. There's too many hotspots in this room while he's up on stage trying to demo one of the iPhone or iPods. I, I forget which one. So um, just be aware that there is such a thing as Wi-Fi pollution. It's real. So you really do have to be careful about having too many mobile hotspots, not only from a visual standpoint of like, how do I find the one for the show? But also literally there's just too much in the air bouncing around and nobody's going to have quality internet. I love it. I love it. Well, one thing to keep in mind too, when it comes to your connectivity of your event, major cities are always going to have better connectivity than smaller markets. I know we're pushing this like kind of the big push to stay outside of the Chicago's and New York's and you know, those, these big markets, but that also prevents its own, creates its own challenges as well um, that, you know, you might not have as many options for internet. So for example, you can actually bring in a third party internet provider. I know most people don't know this is possible. Just like you bring in third party AV, you could bring in a third party internet provider. Well, a lot of them are going to struggle in smaller markets versus larger markets. So something you just kind of keep in mind when it comes to radio cities, um, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, also, um, well, I think we'll probably talk about it in just a second, but um, definitely keep in mind too that there will be more Wi-Fi and internet going on in the, as Brent was talking about in like the Wi-Fi pollution in larger cities as well. So, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. So, all right, Brent. We've given them a fire hose, but I think, yep. are they ready for the lightning round? Okay, fast, fast bits, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions. All right, let's, let's talk about it. connectivity for overflow slash speaker rooms. So um, far too often, too, like we, uh, we want to create a session, and all of a sudden it sells out. There's more people in it, and we want to run the, the connectivity into another room, and, hey, we'll just throw it up on the screen. Um, uh, that's a little bit more complicated than most people think. Uh, so something to keep in mind, too, is you're, if you're planning having a lot of over room, fill rooms, overflow rooms, sorry, um, plan on talking about the connectivity before you sign that venue contract. Because if, for example, the venue might be set up that it's really, really easy and they have fiber connections running everywhere and it's free and it doesn't cost anything. Um, but I've also seen it where, for example, I had a client that tried to add on a live stream. We needed our own studio and we needed the ability to get the cables over. Well, what ended up happening is it was too expensive to use their existing infrastructure. So we ran the cables like crazy and it created a nightmare of a logistics plan. So something to always keep in mind as well. Also, Brant's favorite thing, backups. Backup, backup, backup. So if it's mission critical, important enough to have one, it's probably important enough to have two. So if the internet goes down, making sure that you do have a backup. So even if you have a hardwired connection, they can go down. So, you know, what is the backup option? Do you have a mobile hotspot in case of emergency? Do you have uh, the ability to hop on the Wi-Fi in case of emergency? So always good to have those backup options as needed. And uh, a lot of people love online presentation tools, Google Slides, for example, which is what we're actually running the presentation off of right now, or Prezi. Just keep in mind, those are a big part of people's presentations. So if you are not planning on providing internet for all the presenters, make sure that you tell them no Prezi and no Google Slides, only offline PowerPoint and Keynote. Or and 
if you are bringing these things, at least make sure that you've tested it in airplane mode. So anytime there's a possibility that you are using the end services like Google Slides, make sure you've tested it on the laptop you're going to be using with the Wi-Fi turned off, with the Ethernet connection turned off so that you can verify that everything's going to work. Now, that's the same for PowerPoint presentations as well. So PowerPoint, Keynote, you may have embedded something that is actually just a link to something out on the internet. So really giving it one last run through with all of the internet turned off is a great way to make sure assets are going to load, all your videos are going to load, all your audio is going to load, and everything's going to work fine. So be sure you give it that one last test with airplane mode turned on. And this is my last little bonus tip. It's a little bit out there, but um, one thing to keep in mind is if you're planning on doing a lot of wireless microphones, for example, you have 30 breakout rooms and each one has six wireless microphones. Um, the amount of radio frequencies available for microphones is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You can thank the FCC for that. And because of that, it's getting harder and harder to do lots of wireless microphones um, at once. So one thing to keep in mind is also anyone nearby is also fighting for microphone frequencies as well. So just keep in mind, if you have a lot of wireless microphones, talk to your AV company, make sure they have a solid plan uh, because uh, frequencies are really, really tough. Um, so we have a couple more uh, bonus resources on here as well. Um, so one is the uh, how to improve your Wi-Fi webinar. Um, this is kind of a little bit random, but um, I provide some tips when it comes to how to improve your uh, your Wi-Fi. So make sure that if you want to check that out, it's bit.ly slash improve event Wi-Fi. I know, again, I have clever names for these URLs. Um, so go check that out. Um, and yeah, bring it to the to the conclusion. So Brant, what's our conclusion today? For me, it's always, it's important thing that the reason that we kind of talk about this in the sense of design is that we need to start thinking about these things earlier on in the process, right? We need to be thinking about not just, oh yeah, we got to order Wi-Fi because the attendees will need Wi-Fi. We need to be thinking about, you know, what are going to be in our presentation? What's going to be our content? What's going to, what are our presenters going to need? Um, what are our attendees going to need? You know, like we talked about it. So really making it part of the design process at this point, it really needs to be because let's be honest, internet connectivity is a huge part of our life in, in, in most of the world at this point. I, I want to say we're up well up over 50% of the world is connected for sure at this point. So um, we're in an internet connected world. And so we need to start designing our events with that in mind. And that includes power, keeping our devices running. That includes the Wi-Fi. That includes the hard line internet. That includes them the microphones and all of that kind of stuff as well. So we really need to be starting to think about this stuff much earlier in the process uh, in order to truly and effectively design your events with connectivity in mind. Wow. So we want to know, we're ready for your questions though. So if you have any questions, please please feel free to throw those in the Q&A panel. We got seven minutes to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys uh, for tuning in. Um, while you guys are getting ready to do question and answer as well, should I uh, share our contact information just to make sure we get it out real quick? Yeah, I was thinking otherwise we could just kind of look and see if there was anything that we kind of glossed over that we could... Come back you know, we to. did gloss over the chatbots thing um, because I had to go back and, and flap my gums so about. Keep, so uh, keep your mobile. questions coming while Brand explains the chatbots. Yeah, question. so that was just, we had that in the mobile connectivity section. So if you are going to transition your event to something like a mobile chatbot, once again, you need to make sure that your, your attendees are going to have mobile connectivity, right? Because a lot of those chatbots use SMS um, or their WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or something along those lines. So if you are going to start experimenting with things like chatbots, just remember to check those capabilities as well. All right. We got a great question in from Megan. Megan's like crushing it on the questions right now. So when negotiating Wi-Fi, assuming I have a custom SSID and password, should I be requesting a lump sum of megabits, a specific number of users per devices, or a combination of both? Um, it just depends on the way that you're going to negotiate it out. Um, I prefer having a dedicated megabit per second per attendee to be known. Um, so then that way, if I'm not hitting that speed, it can be, you know exactly why um, it is on that end versus if you just say like a lump sum of megabits, like I'm, oh, I just need a gigabit per second. If all of a sudden your attendees show up with like twice as many devices, well, then they're going to say, well, yeah, we gave you a gigabit, but in re reality, you maybe want to pay per user. I just think it holds a little bit more accountability to it all. I I'm not sure if you're the same way, Brant. No, I think you, you summarized it well. And it's it, to use the of your house, you know, you've got 
you know, let's say your broadband is 50 megabits per second, um, which is pretty common, um, you know, that's great for, you know, maybe a couple of live streams of Netflix. But if you've got, you know, someone on Netflix downstairs and a couple of kids up on Disney Plus uh, upstairs, and now it starts to get pretty thin pretty quick. So I would say definitely a, a, a dedicated amount uh, per, per user plan on it. Awesome. Um, I'm typing out this one because I know you're going to want the specific link to this, but um, Kristen asked uh, if about a video that I did on sponsorship opportunities when it comes to Wi-Fi. I literally just recorded that on Friday, um, so it's not live yet. Um, however, um, I would love to um, share it with you guys. So I share. So. I'll a, we'll send it out afterwards when it goes live, but I also just shared a link to subscribe to our um, really epic amount of content. So if you like all everything that we're talking about, if you just head to uh, the link I share in the chat, if I can post this real quick, um, that we email out whenever this stuff goes live. So we'll be able to say like, hey, here's that video on Wi-Fi sponsorship opportunities and everything like that. You can check that out. But um, we push out like an, abs obviously an absolute massive amount of content. Um, and what's cool is we actually just redid our newsletter. So instead of getting that boring like article, 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 article newsletter, um, it's all filled with commentary, includes articles across the web, um, and it's fantastic. I'm not sure if Brent or Lindsay has had a chance to check out the, the weekly sound check yet, but um, it's pretty cool. But if you just uh, go- funny. Sarah was, got, got the nice compliments. So it was like, I read it all the way through. Way to go for the new <laughs> format. So from the readers, they really liked it, but it was nice. Nice and editorial. Awesome. Hey, I just wanted to address one more uh, thing in that last question. Uh, yeah, she also yeah. talked about assuming I have a custom SSID and password. Just so you know, the the the, the speeds and the custom SS SSID. Just in case that's not clear, that's not connected in any way, shape, or form. So if 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 a company is trying to do that, they're just doing that for pricing purposes or bundling yeah. purposes. So it really there's no uh physical or technical reason why those would be connected so if you're having a custom ssid and password there's no connection to to the speed uh yeah. directly in that and it's honestly they shouldn't charge you for it it takes i literally could spin up a custom ssid and password for my network in like five seconds i'm so it shouldn't charge you for it so um, Darcy asks, at my last conference, we experienced both wireless slide and remotes changing slides in other sessions rooms. Has that happened before? <laughs> As the first time in many years this happened to me. Um, uh, first thing I would wide wonder is what slide advance system they were using. Um, if they are using the professional ones that I recommend on all my clients and not the Logitech ones, um, that would probably fix it. A lot of the ones that uh, are professional you have a wide frequent, uh, frequency um, gap. Um, I have never seen that before because we only use the, the fancy ones. But I, I, I may have heard of someone, uh, a friend, um, who using the actual pro uh, perfect Q system actually was on the same frequency as the uh, CEO of a major corporation in the room next door. Um, so that can happen. So it's a good idea to give those things a check. Um, cause I got a nice gentleman in black, uh, stopping by my little dumb little breakout room saying, yeah, do you have the, uh, perfect you in here? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, the, the person that told me the story told me, told me that, but yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, there was a, a CEO of a major corporation whose slides were going forward and backward as I was testing the presentation. If, if you have a very, someone, very large event, testing um, it's not wor It's not uncommon to have someone whose sole job is to monitor all the frequencies. Um, they're like a frequency manager, so they have microphones, wireless, because um, there's so much stuff going wireless now. It just helps kind of keep it on. So we'll qualify what it, what a size of, of an event is <laughs> in a large event because that can mean a lot of different things to different people. Yeah, I mean maybe like pay if you have enough budget to afford maybe like. 800 to a thousand dollars per day for a person someone qualified who understands wireless frequencies could come in and help manage that all for you and be on your team to do that sort of thing so usually if you're running about 3500 to 4000 people and they're carrying right. these two devices you should be talking to somebody who can help you from an it perspective was always our rule of thumb when we were running events anything over 5000 people go find yourself some help these two are delightful but if not they've got some <laughs> good names too so that's the event planner in the room <laughs> Um, speaking of, uh, of uh, us and how to reach us, if people have more additional questions since we only have a minute left, um, I did want us to share our contact information for you guys, basically our business cards. Um, I just realized this has my old email address on it. Um, but dun, 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 But this is my contact information, all my direct contact information. This will at hello in this email still works. It just will only work for like about three more months. 
Um, however, if you take a picture of this with your phone real quick or a screenshot, um, this is literally my direct cell phone number. You can text me anytime. and uh, We'll be sending all of their contact information out with the recording as well. So all of the links, all of the resources, all of the guides, all of those pieces, the recording will be going out tomorrow morning along with your CMP certificate so that you can get your credit for it. So all of this stuff will be coming in. And then awesome. we'll, we'll update your email too. And if you want, yeah, if you want my forever email, it's just flash at helloendless.com now. <laughs> I get way too much good targeted sales email. So, and uh, if you guys reach out to us or by the way, if you download any of this stuff, I promise not to spam you at all. So, um, but the person you want to talk to, I'm going to sell him because he never sells himself. I'm obviously very good at selling myself, but Brandt is a technical producer. So if you are looking for someone who can manage all your tech, not just the internet and connectivity stuff, but you're like, I want someone to make sure the app's running well. I want to make sure my AV company is doing well. And you just need someone like the geek on staff, Brandt literally does this for a living and created the job known as the technical producer, um, which is absolutely fantastic. So definitely if you're looking for help, Brandt is a good guy to check out. I and like that geek on staff. Brandt, <laughs> not only is he the geek on staff, he's the guy who'll save you a lot of money because of the geek and the nerdiness. I've literally seen him take you know, all of those nasty bills that you can get from the AV company with all sorts of terms and conditions that we don't necessarily get taught in event planning school and say, hey, that wasn't there when we went through it the first time. Take it back off. And so he can save you time and money and speak all the words. So it's, it's worth the investment, y'all. I love it. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Thanks again, everybody, for, for tuning in. Uh, we had a blast being able to share this information with you. Um, I think Darcy had a question about CEU credits for watching this for CMPs. Uh, and I see not, Lindsay's nodding her head. So, yes, you're all good to go. And um, we hope that the record, I think Lindsay's going to send out the recording as well. So, you can rewatch this since Will talks 4,000 miles a minute. And you want all the resources and links. Um, we, we'd love to help you. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, Brant, thanks for, uh, for joining me as well. And My absolute pleasure as always. And uh, Lindsay, thanks for having us. Absolutely. It's always our pleasure. Even though you do talk a million miles a minute, it's always so much great content. And every time you present the two of you together, I'm like, ooh, I just had three more webinar ideas, but we have to space you out. But don't forget, you can catch these two live each week on Event Icons, on their Event Tech podcast, if you just want to listen to your car ride home. There's great resources. For those who are asking about CEU credit, we are a CMP or an EIC provider, so we'll be uploading your credit as well as sending you a certificate so that you can get that credit on demand. If you missed it and you're listening to us, don't worry. We'll make sure you get that credit. Just make sure you watch it all the way through. There's a special code at the end. Type that bad boy in and you can get that credit on demand anytime, anywhere. Um, as always, we love having you join us for these webinars. We do it because we want to make the industry stronger. And by doing that, we bring our brains together so we can ask the big questions and figure out what we need to know to make the experiences and the attendees happy. Join us next month. We're going to be talking about making your marketing and your events pop in 2020. We'll be doing one on December 3rd, December 4th, and we'll see you soon.